Welcome to the Cowboy Up Podcast, where talk is all about the West. This episode is brought to you by White Stallion Ranch and produced by Cowboy Spirit USA. The Navajo Code Talkers. Most of us know they played a key role in helping America win World War II. During his tenure as mayor of Gallup, New Mexico, which abuts the Navajo Nation, Bob Rosebro got to know some of those revered men. He joins Russell and Allen to talk about those heroes and also Gallup's other historical events, which he describes in his award-winning book, A Place of Thin Veil. Morning, Alan. How are you? I'm always happy to be here. So uh, I, I'm your chief, uh, your your best friend for for liking this place. Yeah, you are. I I always talk about you and your ranch and your books and our rodeo. And uh, but anyway, uh, I noticed on HBO Max, Dark Winds. That's a new series that's streaming. Streaming is a big thing, and it's based on a Tony Hillerman book. And of course, we've talked about Tony Hillerman before. And it features characters Joe Leaphorn, Jim Chi, both officers with the Navajo Tribal Police. And uh, the first episode starts with a 1971 fictional bank heist in Gallup, New Mexico, which is far from fictional Gallup is. And that is uh, a town that uh, is right there that abuts the Navajo Nation. Um, so well, pretty cool. Gone through Gallup many, many, many times. And... Uh uh, yeah, I it it gives it it always gives me a strange feeling driving into into Gallup and I can't tell you what but you know drive along the railroad and those bluffs there and then here's Gallup and I, I always think well why is Gallup here and maybe <laughs> our guest Bob will tell us because uh, Bob uh, Roseboro well and and uh, of course Bob knows the area of Gallup very very well he's yeah. been living there for over 40 years he. He grew up in Farmington, New Mexico, attended the University of New Mexico. He received his law degree in 79, decided to move to Gallup, lived there since. 2003, he was elected mayor. Um, besides being a lawyer, outdoorsman, author, co-author of four previous books, Toler, Tony Hillerman included Bob as a character by his real name in the novel The Fallen Man. Bob's memoir, Place of, of Thin Veil, Life and Death in Gallup, New Mexico, won a Spur Award. Uh, you've won one of those, haven't you, Alan? Spur Awards? No. You, no, I thought you did. And was named a 2023 Southwest Book of the Year. It's a pretty, pretty nice award. It's good to have you back, Bob. Uh, Russell, it's great to be here, and Alan as well. Um, well, you just retired. Let's start with that. Uh, only a couple of weeks ago. So how does retirement feel? Talk about it. Uh, I'm, as you talk, I'm getting goosebumps. It feels, <laughs> it feels that good. <laughs> no, I have uh, thoroughly enjoyed um, retiring. I, I worked as an attorney in Gallup uh, for 45 years and um, uh, finally hung it up. And it wasn't an easy thing to do, but I've turned it over to a group of young lawyers who are doing a great job, and I, I feel good about it. But I also feel great about just being able to get outdoors um, anytime I want to. Yeah. Well, when you wake up in the morning, do you think, "Oh, I gotta go," and then think, "No, I don't have to go." Do you? Do you are you still doing that job? <laughs> no, I think I've I've left that behind. I wake okay. up in the morning and think about. Um, I'm glad I'm, I'm here, huh? Yeah, I'm glad I'm here, and glad I got some fun things ahead of me today. Well, so it, it's been it has been truly wonderful. Well, what's top on your list of what's what you're facing right now? Um, I've um, well, I'm I'm a child of the Four Corners. Um, you know, I the Four Corners area is where I grew up, um, and just uh, spent a lot of time up in south uh, southwest Colorado, um, in, or southeast Colorado, um, southwest Utah, the Navajo Nation, and then of course in the in, in, in New Mexico, we're born and raised. And it's a special, it, I mean, well, it's the Colorado Plateau. Yeah, it's the raised area of the Colorado Plateau. And um, for an outdoorsman, it's just, uh, it's a wonderful place to be. 
There's so just, your retirement means you're outdoors more. It is. Um, you know, I I primarily am a hiker. I just enjoy, and a mountaineer. I've uh, climbed a lot of mountains, done a lot of hiking. I really enjoy that. Um, I, I ride a mountain bike. I enjoy that. But I, um, the best way to explore the Four Corners areas I've found is is on foot. And uh, there's, boy, plenty of places to do that. You know, um, it's interesting to me, you know, a couple of folks, we talked to a biographer of, of Tony Hillerman, and we talked to Jay Jantz recently, and huge Tony Hillerman and, and Jay Jantz, hugely successful authors who have focused at, at least part of their career on Indians, Native Americans of India, uh, of Arizona, you know, the right. Tono Odom and, and the, the Navajos. You must have had a lot of interaction with the Navajos. I have. Um, you know, I um, my legal assistant, you know, in my law practice was Navajo, just an incredibly capable woman. And I have, uh, have been real fortunate to develop some close Navajo friendships over the years. And they're, um, you know, it's like all people. The Navajos are are good people and they're just you know lifetime friends once you make a friendship uh they're and they you know it's interesting to learn their way of life i um about three or four months ago i um just went with a kind of a recently developed navajo friendship uh a navajo man my age we just decided we were going to go spend a saturday together (laughs) and uh, he took me out on the reservation and uh, and then also some sites outside the reservation that are special to the Navajo people. And uh, it was it was a fantastic day just uh, driving around with a new Navajo friend, uh, exploring the outdoors together. Do you speak the language? Uh, minimally, but it's uh, now that I'm retired, it's uh, it's interesting you bring that up. I'm it's top high on my list. At, uh, I'm approaching 70 years old. But one of my things I'd like to do is uh, I'd like to learn Navajo. It's really um, difficult, isn't it? It is. It's a very challenging language, I'm told. Um, you know, there's and and there are different dialects to it. Um, and in Navajo, it's not a purely uniform language. You know, different Navajos from different areas of the Navajo Nation uh, speak it slightly differently. There's, they can all understand each other, but their dialect is different. Yes. Yeah. You know, um, Louisa Wetherill, who who started the Dude Ranch at, at the very old Rancho De La Osa, which is one of our ranches, she, uh, in, uh, in Trader to the Navajo, cause they, she and her husband, her husband and his brother discovered uh, Mesa Verde. Right, and, Richard. And, yeah, yeah that's pretty interesting stuff. And, and she got so good at Navajo, the language, that they, they considered her part of their tribe. And, right, and, wow. Uh, so um, she somehow got it pulled off. Uh, Navo Code Talkers, uh, you've you've gotten to know some of those guys. I have. Um, I was real fortunate um, in that when when I was mayor in 2003, um, kind of the the lid of secrecy secrecy was finally coming off um, from the Code Talkers history at that point. Talk about that a little. The the military wanted to keep it secret that they had the Code Talkers. Is that what what you're? I think you're saying. Yes, Alan, you're exactly right. I think that, um, and I'm not sure why they felt it necessary to yeah, keep, keep the secret. That so would be long. my next question. Yeah. What is it that they have that is so secret? I mean, what makes that something that that they want to cover up? Well, I think uh, I, I can't speak for them on that. It's it's surprising. They mu- they must have had had their reasons. But well, I I can I think I can answer. I've read that it was so successful. And and for anybody listening who doesn't know, and our family has a little bit of a tie to the Code Talkers, a very, very good friend of my dad's and mother's, uh, who was a guest here for years, Lee Cannon, is the one who overcame that and took the Code Talkers uh, story public. Uh, The military wanted to conceal it because it was so successful. And the Navajos language is so complex that they could talk. And, And then do the translate and no one it was never broken and so that that system was inexplicably successful how many code talkers did they have that uh, in, I don't in know, there maybe bob knows. 
Um, I think it, uh, uh, the number I've, of, I've read is 800, <laughs> which is a, a surprisingly large number. 800. Yes. Um, there were no. I'm. I'm sorry. I'm getting that confused. I. I don't know. But what I, the the number 800, actually, refers to the the number of messages that the code talker sent on Iwo Jima. Oh really? Um. And on Iwo Jima, uh, they they sent out um, uh, or they conveyed 800 messages by code, uh, without a single error. Hmm. And um, the signal officer um, at, at Iwo Jima um, it just made the conc- concluding point that, that we would not have won Iwo Jima but for the code talkers. Really? Yes. And that, the big turning point, really, it yes. was under Iwo, Iwo Jima? Yes, absolutely. It was a major turning point in the war. Um, I, you know... Um, so back in back in 2003, early when I became mayor, as I sang, the lid of secrecy was coming off, and the code talkers were starting to receive medals. Um, there was a a medal, and and a group of code talkers had received uh, gold medals um, from from Congress, congressional gold medals. Gold medals. Um, and in Gallup, uh, there was a a ceremony in which I was invited to come to, in which uh, uh, a larger group of code talkers were receiving silver, sil- silver medals, and I didn't at the time. I didn't understand it, um, but w- but it was is is that the gold medals went uh, to the first group of thirty, uh, and then the silver medals, uh, the, kind of the original core of the code talkers, and then as as that group, that initial group, was so highly successful, uh, the military just expanded it and and reached out to more and more Navajos. Uh, to train them in in the language, and uh, the uh, the co talkers who followed the the initial group were given sil- silver medals. Were they a little mad about only getting silver? <laughs> I don't know. Um, they they sure didn't express it. Uh, and of course, me. there was a movie about them, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. What's it called? Wind talk. Wind talkers. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, was but you that, shot uh, some in Gallup? Uh, in in the surrounding area. Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, at, this, at the ceremony when they were awarded, it was interesting that a lot of the bigwigs we had, I was the mayor, but I, I w- didn't even have a speaking role in that ceremony. They had a lot of, uh, a senator, some congressmen, um, you know, and, and some really high level uh, political folks came to that. But I was an invited guest um, without a speaking role. And I just enjoyed sitting there. Um, and and, uh, and usually, uh, you know, I had a super busy schedule, but for some reason it, um, I just disregarded that schedule and just kind of sat there and soaked it in. And interestingly, as all the big wigs moved on, um, then the uh, the code talkers uh, basically were just coming up to me saying that they they just appreciated my presence. Um, and it was interesting, and I think that's a little bit of a Navajo thing of of appreciating. Uh, silence. Would you say they kind of have a fraternity of code talkers? Would that describe it? Uh, absolutely. They're they're a, they're a tight bunch, um, and not not many left today. Very well, few left. I can't give you a number. I wish I could. Yeah, it couldn't be many. No. I mean, you know, soon we're gonna if we live not so much longer, there'll be no <laughs> World War II veterans left. Right. It's, so I, I love that you just said that the Navajos. Appreciate silence. Um, that's my experience. Yeah, yeah, I think that's. I don't know the Navajos like you do. I I think that's you know it's interesting because they and Apaches are both Athapascan by origin, but have pretty different cultures. Um, when you go out on a day trip with your new Navajo friend, does silence play into that experience? Uh, it does, yeah. We, uh, um, I actually, I'm thinking about what I'm thinking about is my grandfather. He was he was a rancher down in Jal, New Mexico, and uh, I remember him, talk, my mom talking about uh, that they would uh, drive around in the 
ranch truck as she was growing up and then just uh, not saying a word most of the day, but just having, in her words, a, a grand experience. And uh, um, and that's... Um, I think it takes a little imagination to appreciate that, but right. I, I'm not disagreeing. I, yeah. that, you know, most of us talk so much it fills up our our voids and that right i think you have to be a little special to appreciate that yeah the uh you know the, let me give you a little bit about it background on the code talkers the um interestingly the uh code talkers the recruiting station for the code talkers is just east of gallup at a place called fort wingate it used to be a military um it used to be a fort and um and Fort Fort Wingate was actually where the war in the Navajos years before began. Um, it was it was a situation where um, there there was you know a military fort there, and uh, the the military was inviting in, inviting Navajos there to give give them supplies. Um, there were some friendships formed, um, and they they started a horse racing series. At Fort Wingate, and it was the Navajo horses against the military horses, and it became a, a competitive event. In one uh, key uh, race, uh, there, it was the you know the the best horse from the military was racing the best horse from that the Navajos had, and um, in the race, uh, the bridle strap on the Navajo horse broke. Uh, before finishing the line, and the Navajo's horse, where it had been ne- neck and neck, veered off course. Uh, the Navajos um, re- regrouped and felt that it was foul play. The uh, horse went off course, then therefore yeah, lost the race. Lost the race. Yeah. They inspected the bridle and and saw, and it appeared to the Navajos that it had been cut. Uh, they, the Navajos, were. Um, Starting to storm the fort, <laughs> uh, the the U.S. Army, um, uh, the guy in charge at that point, ordered a howitzer uh, to be brought up on top of the horse or on top of the fort and just start firing randomly, and that uh, that took the lid off of it, and that that was the beginning of the war in the Navajos, which led. Uh, to uh, General Car- Carlton, who was the governor of New Mexico at the time, um, uh, recruiting uh, Kit Carson to go out on a uh, on a scorched earth campaign uh, to round up the Navajos, um, and that's a um, was it just round them up or kill them or uh, it was it was. It was, yeah, he, Kit Carson, that's a really good question. So because, let's come back to that, yeah. and we're going to take a, a quick break, because I think that might be a topic that goes a while. Yeah. Thank you, friends, for uh, being with us on the Cowboy Up podcast. We're always grateful for your many recommendations, good reviews, and we love it when you, uh, from time to time, tell us some of the things you'd like us to uh, talk about, maybe deal with. Maybe you have a friend who uh, can have a real impact on our program because they've written a book or they've done something uh, in the Western tradition that will be a great story and a great conversation for all of our friends. So uh, why don't you think about doing that? The Cowboy Up Podcast at gmail.com. The Cowboy Up Podcast at gmail.com and tell us all about it. And let us remind you that coming uh, next month will be a brand new podcast on Tombstone, that's right, (laughs) the town that wouldn't die. The story of Tombstone and of all the legends and lore and stories that have come out of that. Our good friend, uh, uh, Stuart Rosebrook, will be giving the leadership to a whole group of people, many of them just like you, who would like to share their stories about Tombstone. And you will want to listen to that program. It'll be a good compliment to the Cowboy Up podcast, particularly at this time where there are so many things about the Western way of life and the traditional values that flow out of that that we truly need to kind of 
raise them high and uh, show them off just a little bit more. So we're looking forward to you being a part of our team as we press on. So uh, join us, saddle up for the Cowboy Spirit USA, help it spread across the land. Well, we're back. Let's let's kick Carson. It, controversial, interesting guy. You know, some people call him the first dude rancher. I don't because he was the first guy, somebody said once, to take money to bring tourists into the West. That's not dude ranching, but Kit Carson. Kit Carson, uh, the way to start with Kit Carson is, first of all, to, to talk about who his boss was. Um, his boss was a, the governor of New Mexico at that time, uh, General Carlton. And uh, General Carlton was kind of uniformly uh, viewed historically as a, a real difficult guy. But he, um, he Kit, uh, General Carlton uh, was the architect of Bosque Redondo, which is the eastern plains of New Mexico, a group of, uh, of trees and a stream uh, that he felt would be the ideal place to relocate the Navajo people. Um, but... Kit Carson uh, was successful uh, in in a campaign against the Apaches, but he had disagreed with the kind of terms of engagement that were imposed on him by New Mexico's governor. And um, he didn't want the job. Kit Carson did not want to, to go to war against the Navajos, um, but, but the governor's pressure prevailed, and Kit Carson um, uh, then began... Uh, to, to round up Navajos. Now, he did not, um, uh, for, uh, his campaign was wise. It was smart. He didn't kill the Navajo people. Um, he didn't go out there to massacre Navajo people. He just didn't do that. But what he did do uh, that was completely successful is the Navajos would scatter um, when, the, when the Kit Carson's troops would arrive. And uh, then Kit Carson and his troops would simply burn burn the Navajo homes to the ground and the crops. And it became, uh, the short way to say it and to conclude it is he starved them out. He starved out the Navajo people to the point that they could not survive uh, and they, they surrendered uh, and then began what's called the long walk, uh, walking uh, from... Uh, the Gallup area, the Navajo Nation area, out to the eastern plains of New Mexico. And the Long Walk, pretty infamous. Yeah, and controversial. It's, uh, um, you know, it's a, there, you know, as is the case, you know, there are still wounds from that. that, right. that Who still is the instigator of the Long Walk? Uh, it would be the architect and instigator would be uh, governor James Carlton, New Mexico governor, and, who was a general. And it was his way to take control of the Indians and yes. starve and, them to death, really. Yes. And Carlton's history, he was an Indian war fighter, or no? Well, he was, um, interestingly, not so much. He, uh, his post before coming to New Mexico was, um, in, in California. And, um, and, New Mexico's uh, short version, um, you know, of the Civil War had just concluded. Um, the Texans had been expelled from New Mexico, and Carlton came in a little bit too late. And part of it is, I think he, um, he, he was itching for a fight in that he felt that that would advance his military He career. missed the other one. Now yeah. he's going to make one. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and he, one other thing I'll say about him is he had a misconception. Uh, he had been in, in, in California during the gold rush, and he was had the misconception that the same thing would happen on the Navajo Nation, that if they could remove the Navajos, there would be all this mineral wealth that could be captured and developed. Mineral wealth that turned out never really existed. Not gold, anyway. Right. Or Not gold. Uranium and, and yeah, it was, copper. It was uh, there was uranium that, but but no gold, no silver. So, 
that position, that would have been the territory of New Mexico. Yes. So is that appointed? Um, yes, I think it was an appoint. I think he was in an appointed position. He, yeah. yeah, he did not run for office. Yeah, and, and that's what I was thinking. Well, Alan was asking, uh, he, he, I think we want to circle back to Gallup a little bit. Um, I think we talked about, but wasn't there a mayor in 1973 kidnapped? Yes. Um, yeah, it was interesting. I was a student at the University of New Mexico at that point, and um, and as I was driving around, a, a, a bulletin came on the radio uh, where in, interrupting regular programming, the radio announcer was explaining kind of in urgent in an urgent voice that the mayor of Gallup had been kidnapped and escaped by diving out through a plate glass window on Route 66, um, and that an Indian activist um, had who had kidnapped the mayor uh, was was di- died in the kind of uh, in, in the hail of gunshots that followed the mayor's escape. Um, and um, we don't we don't have time to to get into all the details of that, but it's a it's a story. It's a captivating story. And it's one that uh, um, it's it's a story that I, I, I would summarize by saying uh, uh, I've been captivated and I've, I've kind of sought out the details of that story. But at times, it, it's actually felt to me that the story is searching me. It's kind of, kind of. Uh, you think there's people, a book in your future? Um, well, I've I've done that book, and uh, I've written a book about Gallup. It's called uh, "A Place of Thin Veil: Life and Death in Gallup, New Mexico." And you know that story, along with many other stories, Gallup is has a um, it, Gallup is a place of constant struggle. And has been from the beginning, and continues to be. And and there are. Can you pick one reason why, or are there many reasons? Or um, I I think that uh, one reason why is just the amazing cultural diversity there. Um, you know, it, 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 Gallup is not Navajos and Anglo's. Um, you know, Gallup is is an amazing array of European people, uh, Italians, Slavs. Greeks, um, who came there to be coal miners. And those coal miners lived, there's an, another story there uh, about that, about uh, in, after a coal riot, the sheriff of McKinley County uh, being shot shot dead in an alley um, with uh, rioting uh, Mexican coal miners. Um, and, uh, and it ultimately... Um, uh, the key thing to say there is, it, it, as it turned out, it wasn't the Mexican coal miners who killed the sheriff. It was something entirely different. But that's, you'll have to read the book to get get that out of me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's in A Place of Thin Veil, Life and Death in Gallup, New Mexico. So is that coal mining? Is that is that deep shaft? Coal mining, or it was uh, the early on. You know, in in the 70s and 80s, there was some strip mining on the Navajo Nation, but we're we're talking now about uh, 1933, 1935, and that that was kind of the dying end of of the underground coal mining. That was that was dangerous, hard stuff. Um, and, and to that point, I was were they riding over money or just the 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 horrible conditions that likely. Both. It was a strike for asking, uh, you know, both for increased wages and and for better living conditions. And you it, said it was the Mexicans who rioted, and and there's there's several mines in Arizona, of course, rich mining history of Arizona, that Anglo and Mexican miners often didn't get the same wage for this exact same job. Was that part of it? Uh, that that was part of it. Um, the the uh, yeah, the the coal miners in Gallup were pre- predominantly uh, Mexican, and by Mexican they were most of them were Mexicans who were actually recruited to come to Gallup in uh, 1917 and thereafter when Pancho Villa was was running wild in Mexico, and the coal the coal mines actually sought out Mexicans who were displaced during the Pancho Villa years, uh, recruiting them to come to Gallup and and. Uh, gave them houses, put them on land, um, 
uh, they and well, they actually the Mexican workers actually had to build the houses hmm. on land that the coal company owned, and that was a key part of, of the reason for the conflict. Um, when the miners started striking, uh, the coal company started evicting them Off from the houses land. that they had built. <laughs> so, I'll bet that was fun to be a part of that. <laughs> no, it was, uh, yeah, it was a, a, a violent era. Well, well, what's the, where is Gallup right now? Is uh, between what wars is it right now? <laughs> sure has a history of conflict. <laughs> Oh, it's, uh, there, there's, um, Alan, it's just never a dull moment in Gallup. It's, uh, <laughs> give us a, give us a little glimpse of what's going on today. That's, that's controversial. Well, I think that, um, the, well, I think that one of the controversial issues is the compensation of Navajo people for the uh, uranium. Um, the fact that many um, uh, Navajo people who worked uh, in the uranium mines um, have be- uh, died from exposure. Yeah, died from exposure without compensation. A, a few are still alive, um, and and uh, and that's that's one issue. Um, the um let me interrupt for just a second sure. is there is there uranium mining still going on at all up there for now no. it's no. stopped it's stopped okay yeah um there's controversy um i think one of the, one of the issues is um incorporating navajo people into gallup i, I think a lot of uh navajo or gallup is becoming uh, many Many Navajo people are moving into Gallup, and uh, I, I think that's a good thing. Um, it's a Gallup has a history of being um, racially diverse, um, and the Navajos, you know, need to be a part of that. We we need Navajo people in Gallup, and and they're starting to um, just become really. Um, key people in the in the community leave the Hogan out on the res and come into town. Yes. So Navajo Nation is the largest res in America. So yes. And is it? I know an area. Is it also in terms of population or not? I believe it is, but I I'm, I I think it is, but I'm not positive. And it gets some bad publicity sometimes, um, being pretty violent per capita. It, is that true? It is. Um, there's a um, a lot of violence, and there's a lot of uh, death as a, re- as a result of alcohol abuse. And, um, yeah, it's uh, we have a history of, of um, death from alcohol abuse that is, is well, the, the word is tragic. Um, and we have not overcome that. Um, it has improved. But it's still part of the fabric of our community, of our city and our, our community. Do you believe the thrifty gene theory, where they're just genetically, because they they evolved later stages on the desert to where um, our American diet is is and the alcohol is harder on them, and they get a lot of kidney failure, and there's yeah. a lot of health issues that surround this, right? A lot of health issues, and it's it's undeniable that Navajos are a higher percentage of the of the folks who are suffering from alcohol abuse. I I'm not a doctor. I don't sus- subscribe to the fact that it's genetic. I think it's um, social. I think it's it's just that they uh, don't. Uh, they don't grow up in an environment uh, in, in which there's reasonable use of alcohol, a reasonable consumption of alcohol, and and the Navajo people are suffering. They they um, there's poverty, uh, there's health issues, and um, and they they are a people, um, you know, who were simply brutally conquered, um, you know, by Kit Carson. Um, in, 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 a, in terms of leaving their homeland and then coming back to it. And it's, you don't, don't get over that real quickly. It just uh, continues 
um, through generation after generation. What's on the horizon to change things around a little and and make Gallup a little more appealing to people? Well, Gallup is, um, you know, the you know there are a lot of good things going on in Gallup. To be honest with you, there there is. Uh, some new investment in the community. Um, we've developed um, some recreational use. You know, the, the Four Corners area in the Colorado Plateau is just a, um, you know, a wonderland for people who enjoy the outdoors. Um, it's been a little bit harder go in Gallup to develop that, where our neighbors have adopted that more, <laughs> more uh, readily than than the. Meaning on the sort of tourist side, g- gaining notice uh, comparatively yes i mean well yeah on the colorado plateau in the four corners areas you've got durango telluride um farmington you know it, it's just there's a bunch of bunch of communities that people just go to uh, for outdoor activities you know and they have bigger names yeah so bigger names they, their brand is bigger really, yeah their brand is bigger and and uh, kind of the barriers in Gallup have have impeded us, but I I tell you what we have uh, we have just outdoor opportunities in Gallup that that equal or exceed those those places that I've talked about. It's just that we um, you know we, we need to get some public ownership of of some of the lands to develop it for for the recreation that our neighbors have. So now's the time to go to Gallup before it gets discovered. <laughs> <laughs> so now's the time. So. Uh, we're running out of time. A Place of Thin Veil, Life and Death in Gallup, New Mexico, still available? Oh, yeah. It's uh, it's available. Um, our, the publisher is Tucson-based, Rio Nuevo Publishers. Oh, yeah. And uh, it's available on Amazon and uh, in area bookstores. Super. And any... Because uh, you've also done a rock climbing book, I think. And I others. did. I, I wrote a... You know, 25 years ago, I, I wrote a climbing guide to the... Uh, San Juan Mountains, a mountaineering guide, and then uh, up with a young co-author, updated that a couple of years ago. Super. We do rock climbing here, not the San Juans, but uh, our guests get to go out and do real rock climbing. So, um, any uh, any contact information if they want to learn about your other books with, for you directly or? Oh yeah, anybody. I enjoy talking to to folks about Gallup and about about the Four Corners area in general. Uh, you know, my cell phone is 505-979-2661, and our email is rosebros at msn.com. And that's R-O-S-E-B-R-O-U-G-H. You got it. You got it. There's an S on that one. S at the end. Oh, Rose not on Bros. my copy, but. Okay, at msn.com. Yeah. You're a brave man given the cell phone, and uh, do you... Now that you're retired, when we come to Gallup, you'll give us a tour? Absolutely. I would I would enjoy that thoroughly. Oh, we too. All right. Well, thank you so much for being here at the ranch, and uh, we'll see you next in Gallup. Great. My pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, gentlemen, cowboys. Always enjoy the stories and good times. That's what the Cowboy Up podcast is all about. Some person just recently said to me, as a result of all the bad news that we're hearing about, uh, this whole last week, this weekend was full of uh, stories of uh, mayhem and murder and war, and uh, it it gets you down. You wonder what's going to happen to life and business and work with all of the things going on. And then they said, well, how do you deal with that? And I said, some of it you just have to just turn it off and ignore and try and live your life the best as you can. And you should. Make plans to do things now. Despite what everybody else is thinking about the world situation, make plans to do your, hey, it's time to be the inner cowboy. This is the uh, time for a dude ranch experience. This is a time to bring the family, maybe just a couple. Uh, As someone said, maybe it's time for the girls to get together and have a good time. And uh, corporate business people say, you know, why don't we have a little bit of a different uh, end-of-the-year retreat, something uh, that is a a unique adventure and experience. Well, that's what the uh, White Stallion Ranch and uh, their 
colleagues all throughout this wonderful West can do for you. So if you'd like to find out more about how you can have uh, this winter in in the, the place where there's a, a good warmth in the winter, why don't you think about how you can do that by uh, checking out whitestallion.com, whitestallion.com, or get in touch with them and tell them what you're looking for, and uh, they'll find a place uh, that will be just perfect just for you. Once again, whitestallion.com. You know, Alan, somebody told my son the other day, and this was a professional, was a well-known travel company, and they said Tucson's going to be the next big thing. And, you know, Tucson, I think, is is not always done a great job of maintaining their history or getting their brand awareness out there. But, you know, Gallup, I, I love the undiscovered places. I, I just think that it's, you know, you can kind of avoid the crowds and, and get a more real experience. And, and I, I'm, I'm not exaggerating. I'm excited about going to Gallup and torturing Bob and getting a tour. I, I, you know, those are the places that I really enjoy. Couldn't agree more. Well, we'll go together. Okay. That's the deal. History continues to fascinate, and so does Bob Rosebro's book, A Place of Thin Veil, definitely worth a read. A cowboy shout out to Stan Houston's production company for bringing this episode to you. Just discovered our podcast? Learn more about our team and connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram by visiting our website, cowboyuppodcast.com. That's cowboyuppodcast.com. Until we meet again, this is Lynn Weezy Sneed reminding you to sit tall and ride safe. <laughs>